I always hesitate to call Ross my old my oldest ringing friend because it's not a very nice thing to say, but it's true. Um, I'll just see if I can get the um, the uh, PowerPoint up, and then we can be going. What is the topic? So everybody, if everybody could make sure they're muted, um, that would be great. And hopefully you can all see um, uh, the PowerPoint. Well, good evening, everybody, again. Um, Ross has uh, mentioned in his introduction um, how I spent my lockdown, um, the first one at least, um, which was in the 1940s. Um, researching into um, the last time that there was a ban on um, ringing to the extent that we've been experiencing um, at the moment. And it was all triggered really or, or kicked off because I wanted to do a bit of research. And there was mentioned back in March last year on a number of occasions about this is the first time since da 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 da. And I thought, well, uh, what, what actually did happen in 1940, 1943? So I thought I'd um, do a bit of research um, which involved, as Ross said, mostly research I could do at home, online, um, with uh, the Ringing Worlds and Hansards, various other sources. Um, but unfortunately, I, fortunately, I could I could fit in a before the second lockdown in September. I could fit in a trip to the National Archives in Kew to to fill in a lot of the gaps in terms of what the government and what the church and what the military, um, obviously not open to the public at the time or recorded. Um, we're up to. So this talk tonight um, is based on the um, ensuing series of four articles that were published in The Ringing World um, last December and January. And it takes its model um, as the programme, um, which many of you may have heard on BBC Radio 4, called The Long View. Now in that programme, a contemporary event or phenomenon is taken and compared to historical events, which appear to have some similarities. So I shall start this talk this evening as they do on that radio programme. Uh, the ringing of church bells is stopped. Towers fall silent, eventually limited ringing returns for Sundays only. But there is no practice or peel ringing. The ringing world has editorials and prints letters on the subject as ringers express frustration and some anger at this infring infringement on their activity. There is some confusion and a lack of clarity over how the rules should be applied. There is concern that the continuation of the ban will damage the long-term future of ringing. This is the case in 2021. It was this also the situation between June 1940 and June 1943. The wartime ban was announced on the wireless, as it was called in those days, on the 13th of June 1940 just over a week after the evacuation of Allied forces from Dunkirk was completed. And it was given legal force by the Control of Noise Defence Order 1940, made on the 19th of June, 1940. The first and most important paragraph reads, quote, no person shall in any area in Great Britain sound any church bell or cause or permit any church bell to be sounded, except for the purpose of making a signal in accordance with directions given by a commissioned officer of His Majesty's forces or the chief police officer of the area to indicate that members of an enemy force are landing or attempting to land or, or have landed from the air. And those words from the air are quite important. In March 1943, Lord Geddes gave an account of the origin of this order Again, quote, Lord Ironside, who was then Chief of the Imperial General Staff, was in my room. I think it was he who said, how are you going to get these local defence volunteers together if parachutists suddenly appear? And somebody in the room, not I, said, why, we will ring the church bells until we can think of something better. Now, first reaction to the ban came on a front page editorial on the ring in the Ringing World on the 21st of June, 1940. A few of you amongst us who aren't ringers will know, well, just to tell you that, that the ringing world then as now is the national, international and weekly magazine for bell ringing. 
As I say, the editorial was on the 21st of June, 1940, and it was entitled Effect of Ban on Church Bells. The editor and proprietor at that time was J.S., better known as Jack Goldsmith. And he said, quote, the order, the order has been made, and until the ban is lifted, it has got to be observed, but it will be, have incalculable effects upon the exercise and upon the art. <coughs> Excuse me. It was reported in the Ringing World on the 12th of July, 1940, that, quote, in the House of Lords, Lord Montestone, who was a former Secretary of State for War, made an eloquent appeal for the raising of the ban now placed on the ringing of church bells. What folly was this to tell our people not to ring the bells because bell ringing must be kept for some particular occasion? Who was the timid soul who suggested that? End of quote. By the end of that month, the letters to the ringing world had started raising doubts, questions and concerns. Has the ringing exercise been hoodwinked into a state of complacent acceptance of an order which is unworkable with any degree of efficiency? The editorial in the ringing world of the 2nd of August 1940 said, apart from the doubtful effectiveness of the, of the alarm, it is indeed remarkable that proper instructions have not been issued as to the action to be taken by the public when they hear a bell denoting the arrival of parachutists. And still more strange is that hundreds, if not thousands of parishes are without any information of, of the official arrangements for the ringing of the alarm bell. It is proof we think that the decision which led to the order was never well considered." End of quote. But this was just the start of the discontent. A week later on the 9th of August, 1940, the Ringing World editorial was uncertainty still prevails and raised the level of rhetoric. Remembering, of course, that this was in the height of the Battle of Britain. More and more, <clears throat> sorry, more and more the clergy, as well as ringers, are becoming perturbed at the silence of the bells without any adequate arrangements have been made for, for the use for which they are now reserved. During the remainder of 19, August 1940, new angles emerged, like the sacred use Oh, sorry, the use of sacred bells for any secular or wartime use, service ringing as is distinct from an invasion warning, ringing morale, and the safety of bells in inexperienced hands. Those of you who read the Ringing World um, today will know that the letters page can, you can start hairs running, and as you would have expected, the letters page was not quiet on that subject either. One correspondent wrote, I suggest that it would be possible for you to organize a mass petition from ringers in general against what is generally accepted to be a very impractical ban on ringing. Whilst a few let letters did all urge more caution, on the whole it seems better that so long as any restriction whatever is placed on the use of bells, the silence should be complete. And finally, is this the time when the authority should be troubled with what is after all a very trivial matter? In the Daily Mail, then there is the religious side of the question. We are told that we are fighting against a system which sets out to kill religion. For that we fight, we need a prayerful nation, a people ever listening for those calls which draw them together. What are those calls? The church bells. Now a series of communications in the war office files from September and October 1940 indicate that there was also no little confusion inside the military. A letter from Southern Command to HQ, GHQ Home Forces wrote, I most strongly urge that the system of ringing church bells to give general warning of parachute attack be discontinued at once, which brought the following response. Quote, there appears to be some misapprehension about what the orders are concerning the ringing of church bells. It is therefore clear that the ringing of church bells is in no sense a general warning and orders are explicit that in no circumstances will church bells be merely rung because others have been heard ringing. A letter from Eastern Command seemed to have completely misunderstood the ban while simultaneously putting up arguments in favour of it. Quote, in some cases arrangements have been made locally to call out the home guard by bugle. Elsewhere, some other means is required since the ringing of church bells is now not allowed. An alternative which I recommend will be the use of hand-operated foghorns. 
I do not know why it was decided to prohibit the use of church bells for calling out the home guard. They provide a means which is available for every, uh, available everywhere. Mm -hmm. By November 1940, the immediate danger of invasion seemed to have passed, at least until the spring. In the House of Commons, Sir J. Jarvis asked the Home Secretary whether he will now permit the church bells of England to ring again. In answer, Mr. McBain, no, sir. I'm advised by the military authorities that the grounds on which the original order was made still hold good. The editor of The Ringing World was predictably unimpressed. Ringers and many others will be deeply disappointed with the answer. A letter, and a letter of that in that edition moved the argument in a new direction. Quote, by making the church bells of England a signal for invasion, every church tower in the country has been made a military object of the first water and the enemy is, enemy is quite justified in bombing every one of them to pieces. Now, inevitably, as 1940 drew to a close, um, the calls grew for the bells to be returned to the church for their true purpose, especially for Christmas. Readers of The Thunderer, The Times, no less, gave voice. Now that the danger of, dangers of invasion seem to have been materially reduced, I venture to suggest to the authorities that there are many people in England who would like once again to hear the, ha the sound of our church bells, calling us to remember and to worship God. The editor of The Ringing World mourned rather dramatically, everyone will regret and many people very deeply that no church bells will be heard in our land this Christmas tide, the first time for more than a thousand years. At the same time, there was a fascinating exchange about the possibility of ringing for Christmas 1940, something that eventually did not happen, but it gives an early indication of some of the extreme caution in government. The Prime Minister wrote, I have authorised the ringing of church bells on Christmas Day. Perhaps, however, you will let me know what alternative methods of giving the alarm you will propose to use on that day. And secondly, what steps will be taken to ensure that the ringing of the bells for church services and without any invasion do, in not, do not in fact lead to an alarm. There must certainly be no re relaxation of vigilance." End of quote. However, before December 1940 was out, this fascinating argument and debate was to branch out in even more directions. First, a familiar target, the Central Council. What is needed is that someone, and it ought to be the Central Council, should tell the powers that be how ineffectual the bells will prove if they are relied upon. With British military success against the Italians in the Western Desert in early 19, December 1940, the editor of The Ringing World had yet another stick to beat that order. He said, it is one of the tragedies of the ban on church bells that they cannot now be used to signalise the victory of our arms. In the meantime, the church's greatest festivals, the country's greatest military victories, are presumably to, park, to pass unmasked, uh, unmarked. New Year, 1941, saw reports of an earlier intervention before Christmas of Cosmo Lang, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He had written to the Prime Minister, the Archbishop of Canterbury, sorry, he, this was, this was a, um, a memo of what, what he had written. The Archbishop of Canterbury has made strong representations to the government, urging that the time has now come when the existing order might be modified so as to permit the ringing of the bells on Christmas Day and thereafter for Sundays only. The Secretary of State for War received these representations with full understanding and sympathy, but he has now informed the Archbishop that the highest military authorities are unable to advise that that change that any change in the existing order should be made. In February 1941, attention briefly turned again to the House of Commons, but this exchange of the 11th of February 1941 did little to help. Mr Wedgwood asked the Prime Minister what exactly is to be the alarm signal for an invasion, and the Prime Minister replied, at the proper moment that information will be imparted. And you'll be glad to know that's the only impression of Churchill that I'll uh, attempt tonight. Finally, eight months after the order, uh, came some official clarification of what it entailed. 
and this was reported in the ringing world of the 21st of February 1941. Quote, a leaflet will be distributed to the general public during the next few days. The people are given full and detailed instructions of what they are to do, and they are told that there will be no attempt to rouse the nation by ringing church bells in the way that the country was called to arms by fire beacons when the Armada came in 1588. If church bells are rung at all, it will be a warning to local troops that the enemy have been seen landing by the air near a church. It will not concern anyone else. And if members of the public hear any bells, it is their duty to take no notice." End of quote. However, back at the War Office, official papers from March to May 1941 seem to indicate a continued need for reassurance. In a memo from GHQ Home Forces to all commands dated the 7th, um, 7th of March 1941, entitled Ringing of Church Bells, quotes, the commander in chief directs that army commanders will satisfy themselves that the following points are fully understood by those concerned. A, that the ringing of church bells signifies the landing of parachutists in the neighborhood of the church in question. B, who is to give the order to ring the bells? C, that the bells in question are capable of being rung. D, that there are available a person capable of ringing them. E, that access to the belfry is in all cases available. The necessary arrangements should be made in conjunction with the incumbent of the parish concerned. Now, in 1941, as 1941 progressed, the, pr the initial frenzy of the, of the preceding month seemed to subside, even as spring and the threat of invasion returned. The new editor of The Ringing World, um, J.A. Jimmy, that was his name, Trollope, sounded a notice of acceptance and resignation in the first anniversary editorial, A Year of the Ban alongside a rallying call that strikes a note of relevance today. Quote, no representations, however, even from the highest quarters have succeeded in getting the ban eased by one iota. And it can only be concluded that the government still believe that the sounding of the church bells will be, be the most effective call to arms in the case of an airborne invasion. What of ringing under the ban? It has received a tragic setback. Associations, most of them, have made heroic efforts, efforts to keep their organizations intact, but most of them have suffered badly. Splendid work has been put in by many officials in their endeavors to keep the members together by organizing periodical meetings by Zoom, modern day insertion. By the summer of 1941, the war may have hotted up with the German invasion of the Soviet Union, but to the English ringer, Anger and resentment at the ringing ban seem to have made way to our native mockery and sense of humour. Who will ring the bells? First, let us realise how things will not be done. The ringers will not be changed ringers. The method will not be double court grants or triples or Norwich caters. C, the striking will be no means what it should. On the contrary, A, the ringers will be German parachutists. B, the method will be Hitler surprise. C, the ringing and striking will be most unorthodox. In support of theory A, the Germans have accompanied their occupation of various countries with the ringing of church bells. In support of theory B, the Germans will not have had time or the amenities to learn the standard methods. And in support of C, the Germans have done nothing orthodox in the war so far. In the light of the above, let us reread the government's injunction um, as set out in your leader, and we shall see that the ringing of any bells where the invasion begins and show us exactly where the Germans are. And this report from an association general secretary will be familiar to most of us who, who have experienced a ringing lockout. Quote, the chief constable wants to know how to ring all the bells. Quickly, a list of churches and incumbents was got together. How many bells have you available for ringing now? Where is the key to the church? And where is the key of the ringing chamber? Are the ropes in order? 
our report must have meant, meant much scratching of constabulary heads. Key of tower in Verge's box in right hand back pew. The cathedral, go upstairs in north transept, what's that? Umpteenth door on left leads to Triforium, what's that? Of the presbytery, query as before. And all this while the German parachutists were coming down around them. <coughs> now the Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison, Herbie Morrison, had written in August 1941 to another MP saying, quote, admittedly churches in urban areas have suffered seriously from enemy action, but it has been in the course of an indiscriminate attack and does not indicate that they have become military objects because their bells might be used for giving a signal, end of quote. This surprisingly was the issue that was to run in the closing months of 1941. To my mind, apart from a romantic version or vision of who owns church property, the following correspondent in an age before precision bombing got it right. He said, the government have not confiscated or even commandeered the bells. They have reserved the use of them to act as warnings in case of invasion. In a sense, the bells, that uh, in, in a sense they, the bells, do not belong to the local church except as trustees. They certainly do not belong to us ringers. They belong to England, and if England has need of them in our hour of danger, she has every right to use them. The government order has not increased in the slightest the risk of bells being damaged. We may be perfectly sure that not one German bomb has ever been dropped with the actual intention of damaging a church tower and its bells because they are military objects or objectives. As the ringing community moves through the second autumn of the ban, the editor of the ringing world seemed to accept its continuance. He wrote in September 1941, again with modern echoes, quote, until the danger of invasion is past, there, is, there will be no church bell ringing. We still do not see the real need for this restriction, but while the silence is ordained, it is useless to kick against it and ringers must make the best of a bad job. Now, back in the House of Commons on the 9th of December 1941, with unfortunate timing just two days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Rear Admiral Beamish asked the Prime Minister, who was in Washington at the time, whether he is satisfied that the high standard rapidly attained by the Home Guard and the general preparedness in the country now justifies the restoration of church bells to their normal function. And will he consider Christmas Day as a suitable occasion for such a change? The Lord Privy Seal, Clement Attlee, standing in for the Prime Minister, replied, I refer my right honourable and gallant friend to the reply which my right honourable friend the Prime Minister gave last year. The position is still the same as stated in that reply, i.e. no. The uh, first half of 1942 was the quietest on the issue since the ban's imposition. In the, column of the ring, columns of the ringing world, one reader displayed a rare example of what I would call the get a grip school of thought. Quote, my personal opinion has always been that once the ban was put in place, it would not be lifted as long as the Germans hold the coastline of the continent. In his editorial on the 26th of June 1942, the editor, after waxing lyrical about England, and it was always England in those days, never Britain or Scotland or Ireland, it was always England, being a ringing aisle, summed up, quotes, we accept the situation, not willingly and still less gladly, but without complaining. We do not question the right or the competence of the persons who decide that the bells should be used as a warning, though we may doubt whether they will actually be very effective for that purpose. We must face the fact but not until victory and peace come will there be any likelihood of the ban being lifted. However, in a year's time, the war will be far from over, but all restrictions on ringing will be removed. In the last year of ringing restrictions, Parliament was increasingly to take centre stage. In the House of Lords in October 1942, Lord Montestone spoke again, quote, above all, let us get rid of the fantastic folly of warning the soldiers, 
and the people of invasion by means of church bells. How foolish is that? And in, in his editorial of the 6th of November 1942, the editor repeated his earlier prediction that, quote, however much we may regret the imposition of the ban, we should do well to reconcile ourselves to the silence of our bells until the day of victory. He undoubtedly was referring to final victory. Little did he know that a victory, sooner than that, at, at, at Al Alamein, was to raise hopes of a more immediate lifting of the ban. On the 3rd of November 1942, the Battle of El Alamein ended with the Axis forces in retreat. It was the first major Allied land victory in the war. However, in government and the church, there was still great nervousness at celebrating this victory with the ringing of church bells. In a memo to the Prime Minister of the 6th of November 1942, quote, there is a good deal of misgiving amongst those who have heard of the bell ringing proposal. The Lord President, the Foreign Secretary and the Home Secretary all feel that this will be premature and that there is a risk that in the light of events it might appear ill-advised. The new Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, was not exactly keen. He wrote, I am anxious that, this, that the decision should be and known to be that of the government. I should myself prefer to wait till it can be said that North Africa is cleared of enemy troops, but it is plainly a point for the government to decide." End of quote. You could be said in terms of wartime restrictions on ringing, um, to mangle and paraphrase Mr Churchill, Al Alamein was not the end, but it was rather the end, beginning of the end. On the 11th of November 1942, in the House of Commons, the Prime Minister spoke. Taken by itself, the Battle of Egypt must be regarded as an historic British victory. In order to celebrate it, directions are being given to ring the bells throughout this land next Sunday morning. And I should think that many will listen to their peals with thankful hearts. Some voices, very few, were raised against this. In the Commons, Aniram Bevan, the future architect of the NHS, asked, Quote, why are we ringing bells next Sunday morning? It is a very silly thing to do. If you want to ring bells, ring them when the final victory has been won. The However, the majority of MPs who spoke disagreed. But the theme of caution was also reflected outside Parliament. The Central Council president at the time was almost apologetic with a preemptive strike. He wrote in the national press, may I ask, the public to be indulgent in their criticisms of any ringing which may be on Sunday morning. Ringing is an art which requires much practice and for nearly two and a half years there has been none. Many bands will be short-handed. Short Those who are left will do their best, but the quality of ringing cannot be as good as we would wish. However, after that Sunday, the ringing world described the public reaction as quote, wonderful, heartening and almost unbelievable. But some of the national press comments was less effusive. The Sunday Times, for instance, sounded a note of warning. But there is always the danger in wartime that its meaning, the ringing of church bells, will be stretched too far. For that reason, we doubt the wisdom of ringing the bells today, and our view is shared by many. However, there were more optimistic reports as well. And quite soon that one, quite soon that one day's ringing seemed to have somehow reignited a slumbering debate on the ban. Perhaps without being too melodramatic, the return of that sound had reminded the nation of what it had missed. Now I'm getting a sneaking admiration for Archbishop William Temple, who appears to have had an astute political mind. Given his earlier lukewarm attitude to ringing on the 15th of November 1942, the day after he was writing to the Prime Minister, quote, now that the bells have been rung, I think to most people's great satisfaction and pleasure, I feel obliged to write at once to ask that permission to ring the bells should be given at least for Christmas Day. There would, I think, be a great sense of impropriety if the bells were rung for a military victory and not for Christmas. Might we not remove the ban and let the bells ring as usual to summon people, summon people to worship? I believe few things would have a stimulating effect on the morale of the country. While I am writing, may I add that I never myself been able to think 
of the bells as a good instrument to give warning of an attack." Close quotes. On the 23rd of November 1942, the Prime Minister himself came out in private, not in public, in favour of lifting the ban. He wrote, I'm in favour of the Archbishop's requests. I do not think the, the invasion danger warrants the maintenance of the ban, close quote. But then listen to a War Office note from General Sir Bernard Paget, Commander in Chief of Home Forces of the 29th of November 1942. I have, not yet been, I have not yet been informed by the Chiefs of Staff that the risk of invasion can be discounted, even though the present possibilities appear remote. Similarly, I have not been authorised to discount the possibility of airborne or seaborne raids. Church bells, apart from their invasion significance, are an essential and an irreplaceable part of the machinery for countering enemy raids. It is impracticable to relax one part of the machinery without damaging the whole. Therefore, no relaxation should, should take place unless the possibility of raids can be discounted for the rest of the war." Close quotes. I suspect the general was remembering the earlier difficulties across his command and did not want to, did not want to do, do anything to unravel that. This exchange does show that the idea that the top, the military top brass would have no objection to the lifting of the ban and it was the politicians who were tied for it, to it was in fact the opposite of the truth. Indeed, the Prime Minister on the 7th of December 1942 was still fighting, to, fighting for the ringers, if only they knew it. He wrote, the question of a practical alternative should not be dismissed. For instance, why could not we substitute for the church bells the, sound, the sounding of sirens for a quarter of an hour or more with quarter minute intervals of silence? This would soon attract attention. Moreover, they, the sirens, are always instantly ready, whereas bell ringers have to be found and got to their steeples. In the end, however, the Prime Minister wrote to the Archbishop on the 17th of December 1942, I regret that it is not considered possible to accept the proposal that the ban should be completely removed. There are two main objections to such a course. The first is that no satisfactory alternatives to bells as a warning signal has been found. The second, that such a step would, it is thought, be interpreted as a token that the government had discounted the danger of invasion or airborne attack. Very great importance is attached to this psycholog psychological factor but no objection is seen to the bells being rung on special occasions, such as Christmas Day. Now, reading between the lines of the romantic imagery and patriotism of last Sunday, the first editorial on the ringing world after the ringing on the 15th of November, you can detect a new optimism. It was a great duty and a great privilege which was laid on us ringers last Sunday. The way in which last Sunday's ringing captured the imagination of the people was wonderful. The effects of the events of last Sunday on the exercise and its fortunes will not be small. We can now look forward to future, the future with redoubled confidence. The bells of England have not lost their hold on the affections and sentiments of the people of England, and it does not look as if they ever will. And indeed, a parliamentary reply to a question on the 1st of December 1942 indicated the first chink of light. Petty Officer Herbert asked the Secretary of State for War whether in the light of recent events, will he reconsider the decision to use church bells as a military signal and adopt some arrangement will not deprive the community of their bells. In response, Sir John Grigg, the question is now being considered. Attention quickly moved to whether or not the church bells could be rung for Christmas for the first time in two years. And there were a series of commons questions. In the editorial, Ringing World editorial Christmas Bells, the editor speculated, we find it difficult to believe that they, military authorities, have now any particular interest in the matter. Why then should not the ban be lifted and whence comes the present opposition and indecision? About that we can only conjecture, but we believe ourselves that the deciding factor is the opinion of the Prime Minister. Slightly unfair, we might say today, given the accounts earlier, of the secret conversations between the government and the military. However, in the end, the bells were permitted to be rung for Christmas Day 1942, with reports of this ringing appearing in the ringing world in January 1943. 
and there on the right of the um, column is actually from Lyme Regis in our, our guild. In the early months of 1943, after the, a promise, the promise aroused by the two brief liftings of the BAM, the momentum for a lifting or relaxation of it appeared to slow down. Quote, the bells are, can now, are now considered by the government to be a very good occasional tonic for the people. The bells are, like much else, controlled by the government, and occasionally we are treated to a ration of bell ringing. The Ringing World editorial on the 19th of February 1943 was downbeat. Since the temporary lifting at Christmas, sorry, so since the temporary lifting at Christmas time of the ban on the use of church bells, the demands in Parliament and the press for its total abolition have abated. Why? The answer we are we are convinced is not because it is fear that the ringing of bells would cause, cause a panic, but because it might lead to careless and unthinking people to imagine unconsciously that there is less need now for effort. And chiefly because the Prime Minister attaches great use to the a great value to the use of church bells at times of victory. We shall not be surprised if the general restrictions remain until the end of the war. But in March 1943, the government did make a small amendment to the order. Uh, on the 11th of March in the House of Commons, quote, instructions have been issued for church bells to be used as a local alarm for for raids and any other forms of attack by enemy seaborne or airborne troops. The official, the official papers show that this change was made, quote, to react to enemy commando raids, whether airborne or seaborne. But as far as the bell, wing, bell ringers were concerned, this change had little practical effect. The ban remained. And for the editor of the ringing world, in my words, well, that's that. The government has taken this opportunity to review the ban and this, uh, this is all they're prepared to do. In his own words, ringers generally, and not only ringers, will have read with disappointment and regret that a new edition of the order has been issued. It puts to an end, definitely we fear, of, um, to, to all hopes that there will be some relaxation of the restriction, even if its total abolition was out of the question. We as ringers must submit. Did the editor not know what was to happen in five days time in the House of Lords? A debate that was once again to force the government to think again. On the 31st of March, 1943, in a debate on the ringing of church bells in the House of Lords, the Archbishop of York, Cyril Garbutt, moved to resolve, quote, that the ban on the ringing of church bells should be now lifted or modified. In his opening speech, he said, I want, it make it, I want to make it quite clear at the very outset that I am not moving this motion on the grounds that all danger, either, either of invasion from sea or from the air, has passed away. I am moving it because I wish to submit to your lordships that a large number of cases, in a large number of cases, the ringing of church bells would give no kind of useful warning. And in other cases where the bells might be useful in that way, they could be rung without interfering with the ordinary ringing of the bells. And that therefore it is both unreasonable and unnecessary to silence bells, which for centuries have been so closely associated both with the religion and life of the country. Three others, three other peers spoke in what was a short debate, all in favor of the motion. No one spoke against except Lord Croft, who replied to the debate, the debate for the government. He said, we share the desire of the most reverent prelate, prelate that the church bells should again come into general use. But, but so long as we are convinced that it is the only signal which can be regarded as a distinctive and definite warning, no alteration in the existing arrangement can be made. The motion was withdrawn but the Archbishop did fire a warning shot at the government. He said, I hope in the near future, it will be possible for the noble Lord to make some further statement on the subject. If some satisfactory statement is not made in the near future, I should be bound to bring this matter up again and take it to a division. That same day, our friend William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury, 
wrote another politically astute and clever letter to the Prime Minister. He said, I am writing to ask if permission may be given for the ringing of church bells on Easter Day. I think you will agree that the bells should be rung on Easter Day if, if on any day at all. The Archbishop of York is raising the whole question about the use of church bells in the House of Lords. He consulted me about this and I told him that I, that I completely sympathise with him, but it was not at all at my suggestion that he took this step. I shall of course, course be very glad if the larger permission for which he is asking can be given, but I hope that this bigger question will not in any way be allowed to prejudice the request that I have just made for Easter and Whitsuntide. Cleverly hedging his bets. The reaction to the Lord's debate was swift and the momentum for change was back. In the Daily Telegraph, quote, the matter has not been given proper consideration and the, the authorities should think again. It looks like a case of mere inertia. Viscount Cranbourne, leader of the House of Lords, wrote the day after the debate to a government colleague, quote, the cumulative effect of the debate on the House was very great, and the government would certainly have been defeated if the Archbishop had taken his motion to a division. In conversation with the Prime Minister after the Cabinet this morning, I mentioned the debate as feeling in the House was obviously so strong. Now, even a strong government with the wartime powers does not want to face a public defeat in Parliament, so the government now moved rapidly. At the War Cabinet on the 5th of April 1943, quotes, the Secretary of State for War said the debate in the House of Lords had shown that there was very strong feeling in favour of permission being given for the church bells to be rung. On the 12th of April 1943, the War yes. Cabinet discussed yes discuss the suggestion, quote, that the restriction on the ringing of church bells might now be entirely removed. The War Cabinet on the 16th of April 1943 considered a note from the Prime Minister himself. He wrote, I see no reason why, outside of specially regulated areas, the church bells should not ring on Sundays, Good Fridays and Good Friday and other special days. The Chiefs of Staff have stated that there will be no invasion this year. There is, in my opinion, no danger that the, the announcement that the ringing of the church bells will no longer play a part in our precautions against invasion would discourage our Home Guard or induce any degree of slothful inertia amongst the regular forces. The Chiefs of Staff concur. On the 20th of April 1943, Hitler's birthday, the Prime Minister spoke in the House of Commons. He said, the War Cabinet, after receiving the advice of the Chiefs of Staff, have reviewed this question in the light of changing circumstances. We have reached the conclusion that the existing orders on the subject can now be relaxed and that the church bells should be rung on Sundays and other special days in the ordinary manner to summon, wor summon worshippers to church. The new arrangement will be brought into effect in time for the Easter celebrations this year. In a handwritten personal minute from the Prime Minister to Sir Edward Bridges, the Cabinet Secretary, headed action this day, the Prime Minister went a little further than he had in the House. He wrote, the ringing of, the ringing of bells to summon worshippers, as described in my answer today, does not mean that the bells should be rung at odd times for weddings or funerals. This may come in a few months, but not yet. Although the ringing of the bells will no longer have the significance of an invasion signal, this idea has been so seriously inculcated that unexpected ringing at unusual times might cause alarm. On the 22nd of April in the House, the Prime Minister confirmed that no other form of warning was needed. He said replacement does not arise. And again, he underlined that the significance of invasion no longer attaches to the ringing of bells. In the national press, the leader in the Times remarked, quote, the opinion was widely held that the silencing the bells could no longer be justified on strictly military grounds. Whilst the Daily Telegraph wrote, gratitude to the Prime Minister and the War Cabinet is tempered with general wonder that the authorities have taken so long to make up their minds to restore the liberty of ringing. Naturally, the campaigning editor of The Ringing World, 
welcome the news, he said. The ban on ringing is lifted. To many people, and not only to ringers, the news has come as a welcome surprise. But most of us perhaps had reconciled ourselves to the idea of having to endure it so long as the war lasts. But then, as now, politics rarely stands still, and soon a new question was being raised. On the 11th of May, Mr Dryberg asked the Prime Minister whether he will supplement the recent decision to allow the ringing of church bells on Sundays by allowing them to be rung for practice and instruction once a week at a convenient time. Mr Attlee, again standing in for the Prime Minister, replied, I cannot at present add anything to the reply given to, by my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister. The redoubtable editor of The Ringing World struck a balanced and measured approach in The Essential Thing, his 14th of May 1943 editorial, he wrote, the partial lifting of the ban has failed to satisfy a, consider a considerable amount of public opinion and is not at all, and it, and it is not at all unlikely that, the f that efforts will be made to secure, secure, secure a complete removal of the restrictions. Anything like an attempted agitation on our part would be a mistake. Uh, by the second half of May 1943, the government was preparing to move again. In a memorandum by the Home Secretary and Minister of Home Security to the War Cabinet, dated the 21st of May 1943, Herbert Morrison wrote, It seems therefore, sorry, I'll start again. It seems therefore that there should by now have been sufficient time for people to readjust their reactions to the ringing of church bells. The retention of restrictions on the use of bells, although they are no longer used as a raid warning, is looked upon in some quarters as unnecessary bureaucratic interference when no matter of public security is at stake and is already giving rise to unfavourable comment. As there are grounds for thinking that the public are now fully aware that the church bells are no longer to be used as a raid warning, I suggest that the restrictions on their ringing should be completely removed. On the 27th of May, 1943, the Home Secretary told MPs, quote, the government have now decided that the present restriction on the use of church bells shall be removed. Church bells may be rung for any purpose at any time. On the 4th of June, 1943, almost three years after the ban on ringing was imposed, the, edit the Ringing World editorial spoke for that wartime generation of ringers and perhaps for our generation in future months or years. He said, the ban on the ringing of church bells has gone at last. We have recovered our liberty of action and it is for us to decide what use we shall try to make of it. Now, as Ross indicated at the beginning, uh, this has been something of an amazing and hugely enjoyable historical journey for me and has rekindled my interest in research and writing. And I discovered, as you should, I suppose, as a um, historian, I discovered that I knew nothing. I thought the ringing of the bells was a warning signal for any form of invasion. It wasn't. I thought it was a signal and alert to the public. It wasn't. I thought it was a nationwide alert. It wasn't. I thought it was a total ban for all three years. It wasn't. And I thought that ringing for Al Alamein was the only time that the ban was lifted. It wasn't. And I had no comprehension of the sheer range of arguments made in relation to that ban. What of the effectiveness of church bells as an invasion warning? Well, simply, we will never know. In the desperate situation, the fact the country found itself in the summer of 1940, I cannot really see that there was any alternative. It was the obvious choice. The bells were there. I suspect that if the invasion had come, that many of the finer arguments would have become irrelevant. With parachutists descending from the air, you don't worry about finding a key, you break the door in. You don't concern yourself with whether a ringer is at hand or not, you make a noise. You don't worry who you are warning. The signal may not be intended for the public, but they will hear it and they will react. I had anticipated that my sympathies would lie with the ringers, 
And although I can relate to the anger and frustration expressed, I have to say that I found myself increasingly backing Mr Churchill and his government, at least when comparing the government view to the predominant view that appeared in the ringing world. Can we ringers sometimes be a bit insular, parochial and lacking in perspective then and now? Given that the nation was engaged in arguably the greatest struggle in its history and against its, against its most vicious foe, some of the concerns expressed by some of the ringers can sometimes appear somewhat trivial. Having said that, I think a good cause with hindsight can be made that the ban could probably have been lifted earlier or that arrangements perhaps, so, so, so all that invade all that arrangements, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> could have, have perhaps been refined to allow for normal Sunday service ringing alongside a distinct ringing warning of invasion. But let us be fair to the government. In those three years, they did have a few other distractions. Once the debate in the House of Lords brought this matter high up the higher up the political agenda, the government acted quickly and I think in a measured way. Its calculation was more subtle and complex than perhaps contemporary commentary noted. My reading of the two-stage lifting of the ban in April and May 1943 is that the government did not, is, did not think the invasion, the danger of invasion, had, <coughs> sorry, that <coughs> the government did not think that the, invade, the, the government did think that the danger of invasion had passed, but it was not going to say so for fear of encouraging complacency. So it made no comment on the danger of invasion and rather said that the bells or any other audible warning as an invasion signal was no longer needed. Once people had again become acclimatized to the sound of the bells and disassociated them from their recent military significance, it was safe to remove all the restrictions. Loose ends, yes, there've been some. I found no proof in what I saw that all these protestations in the ringing world had any impact on the government whatsoever. They may have, they may not have, I don't know. Also because of the lockdown, I was an unable to access the Archbishop's papers at, Lam at Lambeth Palace Library as it's closed during the pandemic. So I could not investigate the, um, in the relationship between Archbishop's Temple and Garbett. There was something going on in that relationship not, pardon the pun, singing from the same hymn sheet. So here we are in our ongoing period of ringing restrictions. What parallels or differences are there with the wartime experienced? There are obviously huge, huge differences in the circumstances that have led to our state of affairs compared to 1940, 1943. In our time, it's the COVID-19 pandemic that is the cause. Bombs are not dropping on us. Despite Brexit, we are still on speaking terms with the Germans and there are bananas in the shops. Then it was the need for a wartime invasion signal. Now the restriction on bell ringing, church bell ringing, is part of a much wider lockdown on all aspects of our economy and society. Then it was a specific restriction on one activity. In our time, I think the general view amongst ringers is reluctance, reluctant acceptance of the situation. Then for most of the three years, there was an underlying, not always expressed, but underlying resentment and anger amongst some ringers. Also now the concerns of ringers, however hard the current central council works on our behalf, are not as high on the agenda of the church or the state as they were in the early 1940s. For the church in our more secular multi-faith society today, the bells seemed to be less important. And for the state, then in 1940s, the ringing of the bells was an issue of national security. So attracted the attention of the highest in the land, not today. So can we have a long view that highlights some of the similarities? To a more limited, limited extent, I would say yes. Then and now there was first a total ban and then ringing was more restricted. On both occasions, there was a dislocation in the normal pattern of life. Then and now the Central Council acted as the bridge between us and the church and state. And during both periods of crisis, there has been some confusion about what exactly the regulations are. The real striking similarities come, however, 
at the level of us as ringers as a community. It is here that the par parallels hit you hard. Talk of supporting and communicating with each other, maintaining our societies and associations, keeping the ringing world itself going, fears for the future of ringing. These are all common to both periods of restriction. Comparisons between then and now cannot of course yet be complete as we do not yet know when or how the now will end or the repercussions. We can see that the wartime ban and restrictions ended and ringing, although undoubtedly set back, continued and thrived. In that respect, let us hope that history does indeed repeat itself. The end. <laughs>